after the death of my father, my sufferings were so great that if such hardships fell upon days, the days would turn into nights. These were the words of the dying mother, the wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the loving daughter of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. First and foremost, our condolences go out to the livid Imam of our time, who indeed was remembered when the Lady of Light, the most important lady figure in the whole of humanity, was tortured. Our condolences go to our living Imam, to all the viewers on the night of the Shahadat of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra Salamullah alayha. Dear viewers, welcome to Question Time on Islam with your host Naveed Hussain, our Islamic scholar Sayyid Muhammad Musabi is once again with us tonight to answer any questions, any concerns, any, question, any observations you may have about not just the religion of Islam, but life in general. Our Islamic scholar, inshallah, will try his utmost best to answer any questions that you may have. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and condolences to our Imam al-Mahdi. May Allah hasten his reappearance and condolences to all his sincere followers in the martyrdom anniversary of the greatest lady, Fatima, alayha salamullah, the martyrdom which always brings memories to our minds and hearts which can never be forgotten the sufferings of Fatima alayhi salam can never be forgotten by the believers and when they look at her greatness and the greatness of her father and the favor that her father has done to every human being and what he told us that I don't seek from you any remuneration for my services to you, but only to love my progeny. And when you see the sufferings of Fatima after her father, you really feel shocked. The saying of Fatima, which was started with in Arabic, she said, Subbat alayya masaibun, law annaha subbat ala al ayyam, sirna layaliya. The calamities which were being poured on me, if they're being poured on the daylight it would have turned into darkness of night al alusi very well known sunni scholar in his book of tafsir he narrated this statement of fatima alayhi salam and many other leading sunni scholars also narrated that Fatima alayhi salam did say this statement. What calamities Fatima faced? And who did wrong to Fatima? The Ummah, which was being guided by her father? The Ummah, which was being transferred from shirk to Islam by the jihad and noble efforts of her father, her father, the greatest prophet, who said, ma nabiyun mithla ma No prophet was tortured 
as I was? What happened? What did they do against Fatima? Here I would like to quote Ibn Taymiyyah being the well-known enemy of Ahlul Bayt. Even many Sunni scholars say that Ibn Taymiyyah is always opposing Ahlul Bayt. And Ibn Taymiyyah tried always to bring down the status of Ahlul Bayt and create doubts about any tribute, any hadith in the favor of Ahlul Bayt, despite of Ibn Taymiyyah's stand against Ahlul Bayt. Ibn Taymiyyah had a book called Risalatun fi Fadl Ahlul Bayt wa Huquqihim. The book was written by him when people objected on him that you are an opponent of Ahlul Bayt. And of course, every Muslim knows that anyone who goes against Ahlul Bayt is munafiq, hypocrite. So he wanted to, to defend himself. He wrote a book about the status of Ahlul Bayt and their rights. The book was published in Saudi Arabia many times. By whom? By the Sunnis who are not Wahhabis. You know, in Saudi Arabia, the Sunnis who are non-Wahhabis are Malikis, Shafi'is. So those who are non-Wahhabis published that book of Ibn Taymiyyah. And every time the book was being published, the Wahhabis used to collect it and destroy it. Then the Sunnis go and republish it. We have got copies of that book. In that book, Ibn Taymiyyah states that the injustice, zulm, suffered by Fatima, the injustice done against Fatima is much more than the injustice which was done against Hassan and Hussein. That is the statement of Ibn Taymiyyah. I would like to ask Ibn Taymiyyah, we know who did injustice against Hassan and Hussein. Muawiyah killed Imam Hassan السلام, and Yazid ordered to kill Imam Hussein. السلام, who did injustice against Fatima? You are writing that the injustice done against Fatima is much more than the injustice done against Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. Now, please reply us who did injustice against Fatima. A very important question. Because we want to know, of course we know very well, but people like you and people who will follow you try to hide their heads in the sand, not to admit who did wrong to Fatima alayhi salam? Why Fatima passed away very shortly after her father in the, at the age of just 18 years? What happened to Fatima? Why? Fatima was being attacked. Her house was being endangered by fire. I'm mentioning what is being quoted in main Sunni books. Go to Al-Aqd Al-Farid by Ibn Abd Rabbih. Okay? Volume 2 under the title of Saqifat Bani Sa'idah. Page 73. He wrote that group of Saqifa people came to the house of Fatima with fire in their hands 
to burn the house of Fatima. Why? Because Imam Ali and number of the pious companions of the Prophet were in that house refusing to give allegiance to Saqifah. They came to burn the house. Fatima spoke to them. Are you coming to burn our house? They said, yes, unless you give allegiance as other people gave. That is in Al-Aqd Al-Farid, volume 2, page 73. In Tariq Al-Tabari, Tariq Al-Tabari, the history of Tabari, volume 2, page 443. I always quote the Arabic edition. Also, you find that they have come to burn the house of Fatima. And Fatima was inside the house. And Hassan and Hussein were with her. And Ali ibn Abi Talib also was in the house. And they came to burn the house. What injustice was done against Fatima? Fatima's child Muhsin was killed Fatima's property Fadak was being taken away forcibly and lawfully from her Fatima was being forbidden even from crying on her father ultimately Fatima did not live long we have got three narrations the narration of six months comes on the third of Jumada Athaniya. Fatima went from this life as a martyr. The infallible Imams say, As Siddiqatu Shahida. Fatima was the truthful lady, the martyred lady. Thank you very much indeed. Sayyidina, just to put everything into perspective, so what you've just introduced and, you know, many of the viewers, uh, you know, who don't believe in this may obviously say that these are stories of the ancient, these are stories of history books. I think, would you agree that if we put this into today's day and age context and say, if how would the viewers or those who, you know just to picture this mm. our father yeah. who's passed away recently yeah. and 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 then soon after the father's 18 years old daughter gets tortured and due to that torture that daughter passes away soon after so if if our viewers are listening if they put this into perspective, put yourself in the place. I mean, let's not compare, let's not compare this story. People will disagree somewhat. But if we put ourselves, for example, myself, if I put myself, if I had an 18 years old daughter, how would I feel if after passing away, soon after that, individuals came, tortured my daughter, and due to my daughter being tortured, she, she passes, passes away. Yes. So this is a question for our viewers to actually take into account. Should, will, will this be a good way of putting of this? Of course, it's one of the very good ways. There are thousands of evidences. And this evidence is one of the mm -hmm. good, evidence, strong evidences. Yeah, ask anyone that when a very respected person who has given unlimited efforts to guide people and transfer them from the darkness of shirk to the light of Islam. When he passes away, the minimum moral responsibility of those who claim that they follow him is to respect and look after his daughter. She was the only daughter. All other fostered daughters were not alive. 
She was the only daughter. And see what happened to her. Immediately, after days, immediately after the burial of her father, father was still recently buried. They attack her house with fire, fire sh flames in their hands to burn the house. Why? Because they want to force Ali ibn Abi Talib to give allegiance to Saqifa. And Ali will never give allegiance to anyone. Because Ali alayhi salam was being ordered by the Prophet to be the guardian and the leader of the Ummah after the Prophet. Ali is not after chair or post. Ali is much higher than chair and post. Ali being a father of the Ummah, as the Hadith says, the hadith, which is in Sunni books as well, Ana wa Ali, abawa hadhihi al-ummah. Myself, the Prophet saying, I and Ali are the two fathers of this ummah. So the father of the ummah is responsible to guide the ummah and not let the ummah go astray. Ali ibn Abi Talib, was being tortured. They took his right. They attacked his house. They wanted to burn the house. Fatima alayhi salam was being pressed between the door and the wall. She lost her son, Muhsin. She suffered a lot. She fell seriously ill. And she passed away because of that. They took away her own property, Fadak. Fadak, the property of Fatima, which was being gifted to her by her father, years after the passing away of her father. They took it from her to keep Fatima weak financially and she was ill-treated go to Bukhari in Bukhari itself in the book of Bukhari itself I can give you the hadith number just in case if you want to refer to the hadith in Bukhari itself in Bukhari, the Hadith says that Fatima alayhi salam was angry with the people of Saqifa. And in Bukhari itself, the Hadith from the Prophet that Anything or anyone makes Fatima angry, he makes me angry. Anyone who pleases Fatima, he has pleased me. The hadith is here. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. The Hadith number Hadith number three nine one three in Bukhari three nine one three please note down and go to Bukhari and read the hadith in which you see that Fatima was angry with Saqifa people and she did not allow them 
even to talk to her. And she did not talk to them till she passed away. This is Fatima, who is, according to the Hadith in Bukhari as well, she is the master of all the ladies in paradise. Yes, please. Thank you very much. And he said we'll take a caller. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum and thank you for waiting. <coughs> I'm calling from uh, Nigeria. My name is Manish Mahi. Okay. Uh, hello? Yes, yes please, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, my question is, um, in the Holy Quran, uh, the Surah Qasr, uh, please explain the meaning of the Qasr. What is the, uh, uh, I think the different kind of the meaning of Qasr. Uh, there's many Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. So now the the meaning of kawsar. Yeah. Kawsar in Arabic, al khair al kathir. Kawsar in Arabic has got many meanings. Right. One of the meanings a river in the paradise called Kawsar. Another meaning, al khayrul kathir the ample, blessed, good. Allah has granted the Prophet ample, blessed progeny from Fatima. Because the enemies of the Prophet used to say that Muhammad is Abtar. Mm -hmm. Abtar in Arabic means without any issue. The person who has no children at all, mm -hmm. they call him Abtar, who dies without leaving any child. Allah says, we have granted you the ample blessed goodness and your enemies are the cut off those who accuse that you will be cut off are the cut off people and this is what really happened fatima alayhi salam is the mother of the biggest and most honored family all over the world. The children and grandchildren of Fatima today go into tens of millions. We don't know anyone who had in his own grandchildren this great number. The grandchildren of Fatima, as far as the quality is concerned, are the best. Look, thousands of shaheeds, thousands of great ulama, thousands of thinkers, thousands of scientists, so if you look at the grandchildren of Fatima, you find them as far as quality is concerned, the best. And the quantity also is the best. Best in quality and greatest in quantity. That is Kawthar, the ample, blessed goodness. Thank you very much indeed. So now coming back to the event of the door, yeah. we find that there is a great comparison of how individuals came to the door and demanded allegiance yeah. and then they threatened to you know, burn down the door, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Now if you move the clocks forward, we mm. find there's a comparison with this event with when Imam Hussein -Islam was summoned in Medina to come and pay allegiance or else. So there's a comparison there with 
the, 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 the mother and the son of what happened. These events kind of, if you can just shed a bit of light on that. Of, and they were, these were threats, these were demanding of something which obviously was rightly, rightfully theirs. The conflict between right and wrong goes into chains. It's the same chain, but circles, rings. The conflict between right and wrong. The Prophet and his holy progeny were always the most pious, the people of Allah. Their opponents were the people of Shaitan. Always Ahlul Bayt suffered from the people of Shaitan. Always Ahlul Bayt were being tortured by the people of Shaitan. Fatima alayhi salam suffered because she st stood with the real Islam. She stood when no one could speak out. Even Ali ibn Abi Talib, the most pious and most brave human being, because he was being ordered by the Prophet to keep himself patient. Be patient. Ali ibn Abi Talib, as far as the bravery is concerned, is stronger than everyone from the others. But he did not fight because his fighting against them will definitely lead to a civil war between Muslims. And then that can easily lead to a collapse within the Muslim society. He had to be patient and keep quiet. Fatima alayhi salam, she stood and she spoke in the masjid that the Islam of the Prophet is not the Islam of you people of Saqifa. You people who are working now against Quran, you who are claiming that there is no inheritance between the Prophet and his family against Quran, because Allah in Quran says, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood. Sulaiman has inherited David Dawood, his father. So, you people are keeping Quran behind you and not listening or following Quran. Fatima alayhi salam was the pioneer leader who showed the whole ummah the real Islam after the Prophet peace be upon him and his holy progeny. Thank you very much indeed. Sayyid, the question regarding how important it is of being thankful. Yes. And we find stories uh, in, the, in the lives of the prophets, many stories in y fact. But yes. one story I'd like to bring you know, to your attention is what you find of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, where Hazrat Isa is asked or told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to a faraway land and you will see a person in this house and it's that person who will be with you in Jannah. Mm -hmm. And this person was, I, I believe if you could, it's an old lady who couldn't walk, who couldn't talk and, and because of her being thankful to Allah, her rank was with Hazrat Isa, Isa Islam in Jannah. Please shed some light on being thankful and, and, and obviously maybe some from, uh, stories from the Prophet's lives. We have got many hadiths in this regard. Being thankful to the bounties of Allah. First of all, the human beings who enjoy any bounty, in fact, Every bounty is from Allah. But many people enjoy the bounties ignoring the source of the bounty. They think that bounties 
have come because of their own smartness, their own luck, their own family history, their own hard work. They don't look to the real source of the bounty. That's why Allah says in Quran, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نَعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ And every bounty that you have is from Allah. Every bounty that you have is from Allah. Those who don't thank the bounties of Allah, they ignore the fact that the source of every bounty is Allah. So they don't thank Allah. They don't care to thank. While the believers know that every bounty is from him. Those who thank the bounties of Allah, in fact, they serve themselves. Allah says in Quran, وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ Anyone who thanks the bounties of Allah, in fact, he thanks and get the benefit for himself. He will be benefited because thanking the bounty will make the bounty remain. Any bounty can go away if it is not being thanked properly. And when you thank the bounty, Allah will increase on you his bounties. As Allah in Quran says, لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you thank the bounty, I will give you more. So, thanking the bounty protects the bounty and makes it more. Thanking the bounty has got degrees. More Iman means more thanking. As far as the Iman is strong, the thanking will be strong. And those who thank little bit, their Iman is little bit. And we believe that the real grateful people, real thankful people are the prophets and the infallible imams. They are the real grateful and real thankful people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have got this story that you have quoted. Mm -hmm. And we also have got a story of the prophet Dawood, the Prophet Dawood prayed to Allah to show him his rank in the paradise. Allah showed him his palace in the paradise. And he saw just in his rank a palace of another servant of Allah. He asked Allah, this palace, my neighbor, is for which prophet? The reply came from Allah, it is not for any prophet. The, answer, the question was, any wasi of a prophet means any deputy of the prophet? The answer came, no. It is a palace of a servant of Allah who is alive now in dunya. His name is Matti. Matti. What is the noble work of Matti which made him in the rank of the Prophet? Dawood and his son, Suleiman went searching for Matti. They wanted to know 
what good deeds Matti is doing that he has been granted the rank of the prophets. They went from place to place till they reached to a hut. Very, very small hut. <coughs> People say that this is a hut of Matti. They went to the hut. They asked for Matti. They've been told that Matti went out of the hut to collect wood from the desert. He went to collect wood to sell it. So they waited. They waited the whole day. In the evening of that day, they saw someone coming from out of the village and on his head big bundle of woods. He put the bundle of woods in front of him and he sold it in the market bazaar of the village. And he received three dirhams. That was Matti. He gave immediately two dirhams to the poor. And he bought with that one dirham which remained, he bought barley. And he took the barley and he made it himself and put water on it and made it as bread. He <coughs> took one piece of that bread, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, put it in his mouth, chowed it, then swallowed it. Then he raised his both hands and said, Oh my Lord, you granted me health and strength to go to the desert and collect wood that I did not plant myself. And you granted me health and power to carry it to the village. And you sent me a person who bought from me what I brought. And you sent me food that I bought, food which I did not plant myself. And you gave me power to prepare food for myself. And you granted me health to taste the food and enjoy it. Who is more blessed than me? I cannot thank you enough. And he shed tears because he could not thank the bounties of Allah as he should. Dawood told his son Sulaiman, I have never seen a thankful person like this person. A man who is living in a hut, who earns from what he collects from the wood, and he sells it, and he buys his one day food, one meal food. Then he thanks Allah, and he told Allah that no one on this earth is more enjoying bounties than me. This Matti was not a prophet. He was being granted, because of his thankfulness, the rank of a prophet in paradise. And Allah granted him a son who was a prophet. Matti's son was Yunus. Yunus, the prophet, 
who is also called in Quran the noon whether the noon the noon or the noon is Yunus son of Mati so thanking the bounties of Allah is the duty of everyone who has got the minimum sense and more we thank more we need to thank and thanking the bounties of Allah according to the hadith hadith narrated from Imam Muhammad At-Taqi Al-Jawad alayhi salam Al-Shakiru Ahna'u Bil-Shukri Min al-Na'mati Al-Lati Awjabat al-Shukr The grateful person enjoys the thankfulness more than the enjoyment in the bounty itself. Which means that the taste of the thanking is much more tasteful than the taste of the bounty itself. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Subhanallah, Sayyidina, Sayyidina, from the moral of that story that you've just shared with myself and everybody out there, it goes to it goes to show how far we are, how far we are from thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, and it's a, it's, a, it's a reality check. You know, I'm talking to myself here and of course the viewers who are listening that this is indeed a massive reality check, Sayyidina, how ungrateful we are. Even being grateful, we are so, so ungrateful to the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we try to be grateful, then <clears throat> when we try to sincerely be grateful, then we are on the way. No one can thank all the bounties of Allah. <clears throat> but we should try our best. And then we will admit that we will never be able to thank every bounty from Allah. But we must do our best to thank him as much as we can. And thanking Allah is not only by saying shukran lillah, alhamdulillah. In spite of that being good, good to say alhamdulillah, good to say shukran lillah, very good. But real thanking has got three degrees. First degree is thanking by tongue. The better degree of it, that the heart should be grateful to Allah. Our hearts should be grateful. We should not think in our hearts that Allah has given us less than others. Why Mr. So-and-so has got more than me? No. Never think in this way at all. If you think in this way, you will not be thankful to the bounties of Allah. Always look at those who have less than you in this world. Don't look at those who have more than you. In your religious matters, look at those who are better than you to improve yourself. And don't look at those who are less than you in religion. So in the matters of worldly materials, look at those who have less than you to be more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Sayyidina, question here. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I would like to know if one can pray for any relative who was, um, God forbid, uh, an alcoholic and not a good father and husband. He has passed away now. Can I pray for his forgiveness in my du'as? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. If a sinner Muslim passes away, it is good to pray for his forgiveness. Yes, please. Thank you very much indeed. A question regarding the du'a sabah sab. Yes. 
What are, what is the benefits? Uh, can you give some historical background of this du'a and its benefits of reading? Uh, this needs some more time. Okay. I would like to keep it for next week, mm -hmm. inshallah. Thank you very much. No problem, Sayyidina. Sayyidina, regarding uh, the story uh, or the event behind the Fadaq, yeah. um, when did this happen? And you know, what are the facts behind Fadaq, if you can shed light? In short, Fadaq is a place owned by the Prophet himself personally. And Allah, the Glorious, has ordered the Prophet to give Fadak to Fatima. The Prophet called Fatima and gave her as a gift. Fatima became the owner of Fadak. Fadak is a big garden near Medina. Not very near, but in that area. So, Fatima was the owner of Fadak. And Fatima had her own farmers who used to work in Fadak. And they used to bring the income of Fadak to Fatima السلام, and Ali. السلام. After the passing away of the Prophet, and after the Saqifa conspiracy or the plot of Saqifa which changed the system of leadership in Islam, the rulers took away Fadak from Fatima and claimed that it is not yours. She told them that it is mine. The Prophet gave it to me and I have got witnesses. In fact, no one should ask Fatima for witness because Fatima is not a person who can, God forbid, say anything but the truth. But because of their enmity against Fatima, they said, no, we don't believe you. Bring witnesses that the Prophet really gave you Fadak. She brought witnesses. And who were her witnesses? Ali ibn Abi Talib himself. Just imagine. Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is Nafsur Rasul, Nafs Rasul in Quran, wa anfusana wa anfusakum. They refused and rejected the witness of Ali ibn Abi Talib claiming that he is your husband. Of course, he will say whatever suits you, which is an allegation on Ali that Ali is not saying the truth. Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu Something really, really disgusting. No one can believe that any Muslim rejects the witness of Ali ibn Abi Talib himself. She brought Al-Hassan and Hussein. They gave witness. The Saqifah people rejected the witnesses of Al-Hassan and Hussein. And they said, they are kids. I mean, in Islam, we read about Isa alayhi salam who was an infant. And he said, Inni Abdullah. An infant. And Allah in Quran says about Yahya. We gave the authority to Yahya in his young age. How come you people reject the witness of Al Hassan and Al Hussein? So she bought witnesses. But the Saqifah people have decided not to accept any witness. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. That's it. She told them, if you deny that I am the owner, 
You cannot deny that it is my father's property and I am his only daughter. I am his only daughter. So I am entitled to inherit him. Here, they claimed that they heard the prophet saying that the prophets do not leave any inheritance. Whatever they leave goes to charity. Fatima told them, who told you the prophet said that? Did the prophet tell you a matter which relates to me and he did not tell me? And how you claim that the prophet said something which goes against Quran? Because in Quran Allah says, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood. Dawood was a prophet. His son, Sulaiman, inherited him. Also, Allah says in Quran about Zakariyah, يَرِثُنِي وَيَرِثُ مِنْ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ When he prayed to Allah to grant him a son to inherit him and inherit the progeny of Yaqub. You claim that the prophet say that there is no inheritance for the prophet? Just they wanted to deprive Fatima from Fadak in any way. Same people who wanted to deprive Fatima from her right and who claim that the prophet does not leave any inheritance, they themselves came to Aisha and they requested Aisha to allow because she was one of the wives of the prophet so she has got share in the house of the prophet by inheritance they requested her to allow Abu Bakr to be buried in the house of the Prophet. And she said yes, because Abu Bakr was her father. So, if you claim that the Prophet never leaves inheritance, then how come you seek permission from Aisha when she does not have any right in the house of the Prophet because the Prophet, according to you, does not leave an inheritance. You claimed that the Prophet does not leave an inheritance. And now you are coming to seek permission from one of the inheritors of the Prophet. And you know, Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr, was one of nine wives. When the Prophet passed away, he had nine living wives. So all the wives will have one-eighth. One-eighth. So this one-eighth should be divided into nine. Fatima is the daughter. One-eighth divided between nine and the seven eighths go to Fatima only because she was the only daughter. You did not allow Fatima to take her inheritance. And when Imam Hassan wanted to be buried in the house which was the right of her, his mother. Seven-eighths of the house is the right of Fatima. And Imam Hassan, after his mother, gets his share in that house. He was not being allowed to be buried in the house of the Prophet, which is, in fact, inherited from the Prophet to Fatima, from Fatima, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and to Zainab and Um Kulthum and Ali ibn Abi Talib. You did not allow. And now you claim 
that there is no inheritance for Fatima. The history say in Tariq Tabari that those who gave witness against Fatima, those who claimed that yes, the Prophet said no inheritance from any Prophet, among them two women, Aisha and Hafsa. As you know, Aisha is daughter of Abu Bakr. Hafsa is daughter of Omar ibn al-Khattab. So they came to deprive Fatima from her right and gave witness that yes, the Prophet said no inheritance from any Prophet. Same two ladies in the time of the government of Uthman, Uthman wanted to take the house of the Prophet inside the masjid. So they came and they demanded from Uthman to give them their right in the house of the Prophet because they have got share in it, being wives of the Prophet. They have inheritance from him. The history says that Uthman sat properly and said that you too, didn't you come and give witness against Fatima that the Prophet does not leave any inheritance? And now you are coming to demand inheritance from the Prophet? Go away. Nothing. No inheritance for you. You have given witness that no, no inheritance from the Prophet. You wanted to deprive Fatima from her inheritance. And now you are demanding from me to give you your share in the inheritance. No inheritance for you. Aisha got angry against him and shouted, اقتلوا نعثلا قتله الله كل Uthman, she used to give him nickname Na'thal. Na'thal is the name of one Jewish man in Medina. So Aisha used to use the nickname of a Jewish man for, for Uthman. She used to say, اقتلوا نعثلا قتله الله كل Uthman. May Allah kill him. Fadak was a tragedy of injustice against the best lady in the whole humankind. I again remind everyone to go to Bukhari. Go to Bukhari and see the hadith which is narrated from the Prophet in Bukhari itself saying that the best, best, the master of all ladies in the paradise is Fatima. Fatima, Sayyidatu Nisa'i Ahlil Jannah. Fatima is the best of all the ladies of paradise. I'll give you the hadith number. It is in Bukhari, hadith number 3353 from the Prophet saying that Fatima is the master of all ladies of paradise. Means she is above Maryam, above everyone else. Fatima is the best lady in the whole human history. Thank you very much indeed, Sayyidina, for that uh, wonderful and detailed um, history behind uh, Fadak. Sayyidina, what does Islam say about advising how to maintain or keep things in the house? Has Islam 
shed light upon um, recommended things to keep in the home or when nowadays we use uh, advice from other people how to for example decorate or what kind of things to keep in different parts of the home for example the living room the kitchen the bathroom the bedroom has Islam given any guidance on how to keep uh, things like that in, in the home? Islam teaches cleanliness the house should be always clean always means we don't leave the house dirty for one hour hoping to clean it later on no we have got in the hadiths that leaving the dirt the dirt or the rubbish inside the house for any time is one of the reasons of poverty the family mm -hmm. can suffer from poverty if they leave their house untidy unclean for any period of time always house should be clean and tidy number two the house should be well organized means you should know and the children should know when they need their cloth where it is being kept some houses keep things in a mess without order that is not good not good Islam teaches organization to be organized to be well organized where you keep your things also Islam teaches that the house should be nice looking as much as we can say if somebody's house is very small small you cannot help it especially in poor areas there are poor families in the subcontinent or in Africa or in other countries who are living in just one room and you find six or seven or eight persons in one room yes but if the house is not small we should keep it in a nice way and we should take part I mean everyone in the house should take part in the the work of the house means the man should not say that it is not my business that is the business of my wife no that is wrong Imam Ali salam himself being the greatest human being after the Prophet peace be upon him and his holy progeny he himself used to give hand and help in the house and we have got lot of hadiths for the great reward for the man who helps his wife in the work of the house and we should make it a part of our upbringing of our children every child every son every daughter should be taught the responsibility of his share in the house work by this way we keep the house clean and tidy well organized and the cooperation among all no one can say that it is not my business no everyone should do whatever he or she can Thank you very much indeed, Sayyidina. So, in a question regarding uh, some Wahhabis who claim mm. that the the majalis is on uh, uh, Sayyidina Fatima Sallallahu uh, is a newly created thing by the Shias. Mm. Uh, can you shed light on when did uh, the actual majlis uh, start in, in his in, in history, basically? The majalis of Fatima to Zahra Ali Salam started right from the beginning. The sincere followers of Ahlul Bayt 
started mourning and crying or the tragedies of Fatima al Zahra السلام, right from the beginning. In fact, when Fatima السلام, passed away and she was buried in Medina in unknown place, till today we don't know where is the exact place of the shrine of Fatima السلام, Bani Hashim the family of the Prophet, they had a majlis of Aza. That is in, in the Sunni books as well. And all the wives of the Prophet attended the majlis of Aza, except one name did not attend, which I don't want to mention, but Banu Hashim had a majlis of Aza on the martyrdom passing away of Fatima alayhi salam, which was attended by all the wives of the Prophet who were alive except one. Okay. I would like also to reply those who claim that the majalis of the martyrdom of Fatima are new. One of the prominent Sunni ulama by the name of Qadi Abdul Jabbar. Qadi Abdul Jabbar is a well-known Sunni scholar. He has written a book called Tathbeet. The book is called Tathbeet of Dala'il An-Nubuwa Tathbeet Dala'il An-Nubuwa This book was written in year 409 409 Just imagine how many years back More than 1000 years back Because now we are in 1438 And that book was written in year 409. In that book, Qadi Abdul Jabbar mentioned that the Shias in many places of his time, and he mentioned in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Palestine, in Syria, in Iraq, and he mentions many places hold majalis and remember Fatima to Zahra and weep on her tragedies and claim that her son was killed by one person of course he mentioned the name and they recite Nawha Ritha Nawh in Arabic means the recitation which makes people cry on Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. This is in year 409. So you claim it is new? Go and read, please. Go and read. This book, if you want to see the details, Tathbeet, Dala'il, and Nubuwa, volume 2, page. 594 and 595 Tathbeet Dala'il and Nubuwa by Al Qadi Abdul Jabbar, volume 2, page 594 to 595. Book was being published in Cairo by Darul Mustafa Shubra in Egypt. So the majalis of Fatim Zahra السلام, go back to centuries from the beginning of the tragedy till today. Thank you very much indeed, Sayyidina. So a question regarding a friend of mine uh, told me to give him £5,000 to invest in uh, his business yeah. and promise to pay £500 as profit every year. Mm. Is this allowed? 
a friend of his wanted him to give him 5,000 pounds to put it in his business mm -hmm. and promised him to pay 500 pounds every year as a profit. Is it allowed? The answer, it is not allowed. This is not a business that is usury, riba, haram. Why? Because he has fixed the amount. Fixing the amount means it is riba. Means give me 5,000, I will give you 500 per year. That is haram. But if he takes your money and if he does business, if he uses the money in his business and gives you percentage from the profit, if any, that will be allowed. If he tells you, give me 5,000, I will calculate the profit which comes from this 5,000 and I'll pay you half of that profit because I will be doing the business, I'll be running the business and give, giving my effort and experience and you are putting your money so I will give you say half of the profit or more or less of what? Of the profit. Whatever profit comes, it can come 100, it can be 1000, whatever profit comes. So if he promises to pay a percentage of the profit, if any, that will be allowed. But if he promises to pay lump sum, which is known fixed amount, it becomes haram, it is then riba, usury, which is not allowed at all. The best way is to, if you wish, if you trust him, if you trust him that he will not cheat you because many people give offers when they take the money easy to take but when they pay back very difficult to give back the rights of others but if you trust him then make it in this way which we call it in islam mudaraba mudaraba means capital from a work from b profit will be divided between them according to any percentage that both of them agree. It can be 50-50, it can be 60-40, it can be 70-30, it de depends on them. But percentage of the profit, if any, that will be allowed. Thank you very much indeed for clarifying that. Question again uh, regarding um, invest. Is it allowed to invest in stock market? Is it allowed to invest in stock market? The answer, it depends on the activity of the company. Stock market has got different companies having different activities. Any company which deals with lawful operations, lawful business to buy to sell, to invest in such companies, shares is allowed. And any company which deals with haram business, like liquor, like riba, like gambling, like any haram, any company deals with unlawful business, then buying, selling, investing in such companies shares will be not allowed so look at the activity of the company and if the company is not dealing with haram activity then you can invest in such companies shares thank you very much indeed Next question is regarding the ayah Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'een which we recite day in day out which obviously means uh, you know do, do we, we worship and only ask thee for, for help how come we say Ya Ali Madad is seeking help from other than Allah allowed in Islam? If you read Quran you will see that the prophets themselves 
seeked help from other than Allah. People should understand Quran not according to their own superficial thinking, not according to the linguistic translation, but as the Prophet himself explained, the meaning of Quran does not come from our own imagination. It comes from the explanation of the Prophet. Quran is not a book that we can take it on the face value. No. Allah in Quran says, لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ That Allah has revealed on the Prophet the knowledge of Quran so that the Prophet explains to the people what was being revealed to guide them. Seeking help from Allah is the faith of every believer. But when you seek help from someone with the faith that this person can help with permission of Allah, you are then seeking help from Allah. If we go to the doctor to seek his help, we have got a heart patient. We need help of the doctor, the surgeon, to do some operation for this heart patient who is dying. Are we doing wrong? We are seeking help from a human being, but we believe that the cure is from Allah. If help comes, in fact, it comes from Allah. So, when we go to the doctor, seeking his help does not mean that we are ignoring Allah, God forbid, and we are worshipping someone with Allah. No. When you say, Ya Ali Madad, you believe that the Madad, the help, comes, if it comes, if it comes, it comes with the permission from Allah. If anyone says that I can get help even if Allah does not want, if anyone says that I can get help from the Prophet or from anyone even if Allah does not want to help me, that is completely wrong because no one can help if Allah does not permit. So when we say, Ya Ali Madad, we seek help from the most pious servant of Allah after the Prophet, after the permission from Allah. In Quran, the Prophet Sulaiman wanted to bring the throne of Balqis from Yemen to Palestine. Did he say, Ya Allah, get me the throne? No. He asked people. He asked people to help him. He said, من يأتيني بعرشها قبل أن يأتوني مسلمين Who can bring, who can get me her throne? So, قال أفريت من الجن One from the jinn said, I'll bring it to you. Before you leave your place, that was one offer which was rejected. قال الذي عنده علم من الكتاب, a person who had part of knowledge of the book, said, أنا آتيك به قبل أن يرتد إليك طرفك. I'll get it to you before your eye blinks. It means immediately, and he immediately, Sulaiman saw that. Immediately, the throne was brought. So, Sulaiman did not do any wrong when he asked the servant of Allah to get him some work because he believes that it happens only it happens if it happens by permission from Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet himself, in many places, he seeked, he seeked help of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Which does not mean that the Prophet did wrong. When we say, Ya Ali Madad, we know that Allah's permission, Ali will help us because Ali is Allah's most humble servant after the Prophet. So nothing wrong in it at all if we understand the meaning of Quran according to what the Prophet told us. Saying, Ya Rasulullah is right. Ya Ali Madad, right. Ya Hussein, right. Because we, we always believe without any doubt that no help can come but only and only after the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you very much indeed, Sayyidina. Next question um, is a, a question from a brother who said, I was praying at the university prayer room. Yeah. And a person heard him say, Hayya ala khayrul amal. Yes. Uh, and said to the person that it's bidat. Uh, and I told him that, wait until I get an answer. Hayya ala khayrul amal. Okay, Hayya ala khayrul amal was part of Azan from the time of the Prophet himself. From the time of the Prophet himself. I would like to mention some evidences. Hayya ala khayrul amal. was the original Adhan. Adhan, in the beginning, was with Hayya ala khayr al-amal. All the time of the Prophet, Adhan had Hayya ala khayr al-amal. All the time of the government of Abu Bakr, also Hayya ala khayr al-amal. Part of the time of Umar, Hayya ala khayr al-amal. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab thought to remove this statement from Adhan. We have lot of evidences to prove that Hayya ala khayr al-amal was part of Adhan. I'll give you here in short. In Sunan al-Bayhaqi, Sunan al-Bayhaqi al-Kubra, volume one, page four, two, five. Adhan of the Prophet with Hayya ala khayr al-amal till Umar ibn al-Khattab removed it and put in its place as-salatu khayrun min al-nawm in the Adhan of morning prayer. Otherwise, the original Adhan of the Prophet was with Hayya ala khayr al-amal. I'm quoting here Sunan al-Bayhaqi al-Kubra volume one page four to five. Also, Al Tabarani in his Al Mu'jam Al Kabir, volume one, page three five two, the Hadith says that the Adhan is with Hayy ala Khayr al Amal. In Kanzul Ummal, volume eight. Page 162, also Hayya ala khayr al-amal. In Majma' al-Zawaid by Al-Haythami, volume 1, page 330, same Hayya ala khayr al-amal. Al-Shawkani in Al-Sayl al-Jarrar, volume 1, page 205, Hayya ala khayr al-amal as part of Adhan. We have got long list of evidences that the original Adhan of Islam was with Hayya ala khayr al-amal. Thank you very much indeed. So now we have run out of time, but we'll just go through one last question. Please. It's, uh, my mother told me wait for some time before praying morning prayers. 
How much time I have to wait after the Fajr time kicks in? His mother told him to wait, to wait from Azan time or before Azan time. It means no question of waiting if you are sure that Fajr time has started, has began. If you are not sure, say for example, if you are not sure whether the Fajr time is 5, 10 or 5.15, then wait till 5.15. But if you are sure that Fajr time is definitely 5.15, not later, then no question of waiting. So waiting if you are not sure. But if you are sure that the Fajr has started, mm -hmm. then it is recommended to pray on the beginning of the time. I would like to remind about the very great importance of praying Fajr namaz on time, not to delay it. Nowadays, a lot of people being affected by the non-Muslims, they don't get up for morning prayer. They sleep as if there is no morning prayer. That is not good at all. There is a hadith that the person who sleeps and does not perform morning prayers on time will be called from the sky, Ya Khasir, oh loser, loser. We need to try our best by fixing an alarm, our mobiles, asking someone to wake us up. We have to perform our morning prayer on time. That is very important. And the hadith says that the most heavy salah, namaz, on the munafiq is morning prayer. We should not be like the munafiq. We should be good mu'mineen, obedient mu'mineen, and perform salat, a subh, morning prayer, on time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for all the callers that called in and of course those who message in. Do join us same time next week live from the Alabash Studios. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.